Welcome to the worship of the Lord Jesus Christ, our risen Savior, as we celebrate the worship of the Lamb who is on the throne. We especially welcome our guests that are here today in the sanctuary or in our overflow rooms, and we welcome those who are worshiping online. If you don't have a bulletin, if you'll raise your hand, an usher will bring you a bulletin. It'll help you and guide you in your participation in worship. In the pew rack, there's a guest information card. We'd love to have information about how we can serve you. You may have questions about what it means to be a Christian or questions about what it means to be a member of a church. On the back, there's a place for prayer cards. You can place this in the offering basin during our offertory. Now, as we prepare our hearts for worship, focus on this reality. The Lamb who was slain is risen and worthy of all our worship.
gift. I want you to know that our risen Lord Jesus Christ, the worthy Lamb who was slain for you, now invites you in to the worship of the triune God, and we welcome you as well. Let's stand and respond to this call to worship. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Let's worship this risen Savior with hymn number 277. Christ, we praise you that you live. Jesus, you love. Jesus, you save. You died and rose again, and 
You intercede for us at the Father's right hand. Thank you, Father, for loving us and sending Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for sending us the Holy Spirit. Fill us with your love, and if there's anyone here today that does not know salvation in Jesus Christ, we pray that today would be the day of salvation. And all God's people say together, amen. Apostles' Creed, the church for centuries has declared that our hope and foundation is not in ourselves, not in our own efforts, but in God himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let's confess our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. Third day, he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand, God the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
We start your Bibles to Luke chapter 24. Bible provided for you in the pew. The page we'll be reading is on page 1051. Our Holy Week series has been Holy Week through the eyes of Jesus. And if you did not hear all the sermons, I would encourage you to go on our website, uh, YouTube channel, First Pres Augusta. Has a website, um, has a YouTube channel, and catch all of those messages. We're now in Luke 24 and in Mark and John in the sermon as well. Luke 24, starting in verse 1. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel, lightning garments. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles But these words seemed to them as idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise be to you, O Christ. We sang no guilt in life, no fear in death. That's because Jesus came and took our place on the cross, and then in defeating death, ascended to the right hand and invites us to his place. We're told that the throne in heaven that he reigns on is a throne of grace, and that we're invited, if we belong to him, to draw near with confidence, obtain mercy, and find grace to help in time of need. If you're able, I invite you to kneel. First, we'll confess our sins corporately, And then we'll confess our sins personally to this, our Savior on the throne. Let's confess corporately together now. Almighty God, who by the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, has given eternal life to all who believe in him, and who has called us to live pure and joyful lives, We confess that we have failed to live as we ought. We have forgotten your promises and have ignored your commandments. We have not followed after our risen Savior with hearts of grateful service, courageous faith, or glad obedience. We are profoundly sorry and would earnestly repent. Please forgive us and revive our hearts that we might with steadfast affection glorify you in thought, word, and deed for the glory of our resurrected Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now hear these words of assurance of pardoning grace to all who belong to Christ. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. With this assurance, in order to praise him, let's stand and sing, Jesus Christ is risen today. The words are in the bulletin.
please be seated and please continue with me in prayer. Father, when you ask, who shall I send and who will go for us? Thank you, Jesus, that you answered. Here am I, Lord, send me. And Jesus, in the garden, when you asked for the cup of wrath to be removed, you said, not my will, but yours, O Father, be done. For the joy set before you, Jesus, you endured the cross, despising its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high in order to purchase salvation for all who belong to you. Would you continue to save, continue to take your place in this world as the conquering king who is also the suffering servant? The cross is the place where all wounds are healed, and we thank you that we draw near to you because of your deep, deep love, Jesus. We pray for the gospel message to go forth from this church in these neighborhoods that we live, in this state and country and around the world, that you would send forth the gospel with power. The risen Lord Jesus Christ lives. The risen Lord Jesus Christ loves. The risen Lord Jesus Christ saves. The risen Lord Jesus Christ is coming again. And that's a message of healing and hope. We pray for those in our midst that are dealing with grief. Be near to John and Claire Weaver as they said goodbye to Claire's mother and celebrated your faithfulness. We pray that for Stephen Poor and his family as his mother has passed away. And for Bruce and Jan Larkin and Jenny Wilson losing her brother and Bruce and Jan, their son. We ask you to be near to that family. We love them so dearly. We do pray for Martha Killian in the hospital. We do continue to lift up Moses Brower and Margie Betts and Helen Bates. We thank you for miracles of mercy we've seen with Peggy Green and Rafi Basali and Jim Scarborough. We pray for continued healing grace and mercy, Father, in our midst. We thank you, Lord, for the way that your church is cared for by the giving of your people. Thank you for the faithful weekly giving of your people. Use these gifts, we pray, to advance your work in the world. All this we pray in the powerful name of Christ. And as we pray, we use the words Christ taught his disciples as we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. Reflect on this music as we give as an act of worship. Thank you for reminding us 
because he lives, we can face tomorrow. So blessed with so many talented musicians in this church. And our guests, thank you all for being here. And Wycliffe Gordon, dear brother, thank you for sharing your gifts. Just one announcement. We will not be gathering as is our normal practice at 6 p.m. tonight. Being this is a family day, we ask you to spend time enjoying time with your family and in family prayer as you celebrate Christ's resurrection. After the service, the youth staff uh, have a professional photographer and families can take family photos. The donations go to the youth missions trip for the summer. Now let's stand and greet one another in the peace of Christ. Peace of the Lord be with you always and also with you. Stand and greet one another. Please be seated. Thank you very much. Turn now in your Bibles to Mark chapter 15. We'll read the end of Mark chapter 15 and the first few verses of chapter 16 as we look at God's Word today. Speaking of resurrection, um, this podium in the last couple of years has risen about a foot too high. We have a pastor in our church, Ken McHurd, and he's like nine feet tall. And so <laughs> I feel like I, I could sleep during my own sermon on this podium. I'm not bitter. Don't, don't hear that as bitter. We've been going through Holy Week 
through the eyes of Peter. How would Peter experience the passion of our Lord? We started last Sunday morning on Palm Sunday, last Sunday night, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday noon, Good Friday evening, and now today is the conclusion of that series. We're asking, how would Peter have experienced the passion of the Lord Jesus? What I want to do is read to you from the end of Mark 15, because I want to lay a foundation for Resurrection Sunday in the reality and the, the, the truth of the resurrected Christ, and then I want to focus on 16, 1 through 8. But before I do, let's pray and ask God to be with us. O Holy Spirit of God, the one who raised Jesus from the dead, would you open our eyes and our hearts with that same divine resurrected power that we would be forever transformed by your word. We humbly ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Mark chapter 15, right in the last stages of the crucifixion of Jesus, we'll pick up at verse 37. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. There were also women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, the younger and of Joseph and Salome. When he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him. And there were also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. And when evening came, since it was the day of preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath, and no work could be done on the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that Jesus should have already died. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. And Joseph brought a linen shroud and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to, to the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. Mark makes clear we understand it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, an angel, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go. Tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise be to you, O Christ. I mentioned to you that I want to set a foundation here. And what I want you to see is this. Mark assumes the reality of the resurrection. To him and to those who have eyes to see, it is indisputable. Mark is going to ground the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus in such a way that we understand its historic fact. I'll show you from these verses. Now, Mark as a writer, as a gospel writer, is in a hurry to get to the point. He doesn't waste time. So for him to emphasize these things here, he wants us to understand that the resurrection is assumed. It's a given. It's true. Let me show you how. First of all, there's this 
human figure in history, Joseph of Arimathea. And we see in chapter 15, verse 43, that he goes to Pilate and he says, I would like the body. At any point, someone could have disputed the fact that this Joseph of Arimathea really lived and that he really went to Pilate to ask for the body. It's indisputable, he did. Then we see the name Jesus of Nazareth. Mark is making sure you understand that Jesus Christ is a historical person. And he's from the town of Nazareth. He's making sure you see that. We're dealing with a real person in human history. And then we have fulfilled prophecy. When Joseph of Arimathea goes and asks for the body of Christ, he's fulfilling both Psalm 16, 7 and Isaiah 53, verse 9. Psalm 16, 7. The Lord will not let your Holy One see decay. In other words, Jesus is not going to hang on the cross until he rots like was often the custom with Roman soldiers and his body thrown into the trash heap outside of Jerusalem with all the rest of the criminals. Psalm 16, 7 tells us Jesus' body is going to not see decay. It's very important. Then Isaiah 53, 9, he made his grave with the wicked but in his death, he was put with the rich. Isaiah 53, 9. The rich man, Aram, of Joseph of Arimathea, goes to him. He has a tomb that a rich man would have. Jesus is placed in that tomb. It's undeniable human historical fact that Jesus lived, Jesus died. How do we know he really died? Well, Pilate asks the question, is he dead already at the end of chapter 15? He sends for the centurion who would have been assigned to make sure that Jesus is dead. The centurion is not going to get this fact wrong. His life depends on it. He comes to Pilate and he says, he's dead. A human figure, dead, buried. The women come up. Did you notice that, John, that Mark mentions women over and over and over in this text? And he mentions them by name, very specifically. Women's testimony would have been completely disregarded in this day. So if you're trying to manufacture an account of a resurrected Christ, you're not going to mention women unless it really happened and the women saw it. It's indisputable. The, 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 the angel says to the women, come see where you laid him. See, remember where you put him, where he was put? You saw this. He's not there. At any point, someone could have said, no, 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 that's not the way it happened. But there's no evidence of that. Mark assumes this is eyewitness fact. He really did die. Everybody saw it. The tomb really was empty. Everybody knows it. Mark just assumes it's true. We know that what verifies the resurrection of Jesus Christ the most is eyewitness account, an empty grave, and his appearance to witnesses. And all three of them are in this text. Now, that's the foundation I want you to see because what we're going to see next is based on the fact that Jesus Christ is who he said he is and he really did rise from the grave. That's the first sermon. On Easter Sunday, you get two sermons. Here's the second one. Did you see the grace in this story? Did you see the grace? Years ago, I read a book called Same Kind of Different as Me. It's a wonderful story, but there's one account near the end of the book that when I read it for the first time, I audibly gasped because I was blown away by mercy. Here's the story. It's about Ron and Deborah Hall. Halfway through his career, Rod becomes an international art dealer. And he's a high roller, jet flying, I mean, you know, limousine driving. He is the real deal, making money, selling uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of art all around the world. He's feeling pretty good about himself. And he cheats on his wife and starts having an affair. Ron 
cheats on Deborah. Deborah finds out about it. She's a new believer in Christ. Ron is a nominal believer at this point. She confronts him, and then she says, give me her number. Ron said, when Deborah's in this kind of mood, you don't, you give her the number. He gave Deborah the number. Ron said he could feel in his chest every number being touched. A woman answers on the other end. Ron can only imagine what she's thinking. When this woman said, hello, my name is Deborah Hall, Ron's wife. And before the girl could do anything on the other end, Deborah goes, I want you to know that I don't blame you for what happened to my husband. And I'm praying for you and I forgive you. And I've forgiven my husband. And I'm praying that God will give you the love that you really deserve one day. And oh, by the way, I plan on rebuilding our marriage and loving Ron in such a way that he would never want to call you again. She hung up the phone. The words Ron says were, her grace stunned me. Her grace stunned me. Now, it sits a little wrong with us, right? Why is, why is Barbara taking this on her? She's not taking it on her. I mean, Ron's the dirtbag. He's the cheater. But she is saying, I want to show grace. And Ron says... Her grace stunned me. This text is stunning grace. Did you see it? It's dripping with it, saturated with stunning grace. Did you see it? I'm going to take you to it. Look with me, chapter 16, verse 7. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of them to Galilee. Are you kidding me? Every single one of those guys betrayed him. Every single one of those guys deserted him during his most important defining moment. Every single one of those guys who claimed loyalty to Jesus when he needed them the most, they were nowhere to be found. And the first words that the angel says to cowards and traitors and deserters is, go find them. Tell them I'm going to meet them. It's astonishing grace. And Peter? Peter the one who said three times, I'll never deny you? Peter the one who cursed in God's name to say to a little girl, at a fire, I don't even know the man, who Jesus looked and saw his eyes as Peter was betraying him. And the words that come out of Jesus' mouth through the angel are, go tell the disciples and Peter, I'm looking for him. It's astonishing grace. A lot changed on that day, Resurrection Sunday, the most significant day in the history of the world when the God-man rose from the dead, having paid for our sins. So much changed, but yet some things didn't change. I want to give you just two points this morning to think about. What didn't change about us and what has not changed about Jesus? What has not changed about us, followers of Christ? What we see in this text that what hasn't changed about us is we'll st we're still sinners. The disciples, the women, they're pictures of you and me, those who really do love him. I, I love him. The women love him. They were going to the tomb to show their love for him. The disciples love him. But we're still sinners. We see here what's not changed about us as sinners is that we're still unfaithful. 
They were unfaithful. They broke promises. They abandoned him. They rejected him. They didn't obey him. They didn't listen to him. He was faithful, but they were unfaithful to him. They betrayed him. When the going got tough, they took off. Well, that resembles a lot in my Christian experience. I follow Jesus wholeheartedly when things are going my way or the way I think they should go. They lack understanding. They went to that tomb, those women went to the tomb thinking they were going to find a body, and yet there was no body. They went to that tomb to anoint the body of Jesus with spices. You could call them Spice Girls. That's the best one I got. <laughs> they misunderstood him. He's not going to be there. They didn't understand all that he had said. The disciples are in hiding at this point, nowhere to be found because they didn't understand what he so clearly told them. We lack understanding as well. They are weak in faith. They're not going to that tomb to see prophecy fulfilled, are they? They're going to anoint the body of Jesus because they love him, but they lack the faith to understand what he has told them clearly in Mark's gospel alone three times, Mark 8.31, Mark 9.30, Mark 10.33. He said, I will die, and on the third day I will rise again, but they could not believe it. Oh, I know a lot of Christians like that, who no matter how clearly he speaks in his word, we don't have the faith to believe it. What has not changed? We're still sinners. And therefore, because they lack the understanding and because they're unfaithful and because they lack the faith, do you notice what happens to their countenance? The words that show up in this text are confused, afraid, lost, downcast. I mean, they're walking along in verse 16, uh, chapter 16, verse 4. It says, when they looked up, why do they need to look up? Because their heads are down. They're defeated. They're afraid. They're confused because they don't understand the truth of the gospel. Because they don't understand, because they lack faith, it's causing them to ask the wrong questions. You know what's on their mind? Who's going to roll away the stone? Because they have no place in their minds for the understanding or the faith to believe that they don't need to roll away the stone. That God himself rolled away the stone through the angels. They're asking questions they don't need to ask because they have a small view of God. The disciples are in their room hiding somewhere going, now what are we going to do? We followed this guy thinking he would free us from Rome. <laughs> what do we do now? Wrong question. The king of kings and lord of lords is the one that you're following. Rome is a puppet in his hand. Caesar? Are you serious? We're worried about Caesar? It's an election year. Are you serious? You're asking the wrong questions. Jesus is on his throne. They have an inept, they have a view of God as one who is inept and impotent. Oh, I see myself in those disciples and those women. So that's what's not changed about us since the resurrection. Still desperately need, in need of God's grace. But here's the good news. You know what's not changed about Jesus? He's still the sufficient Savior that loves to lavish grace upon us. He loves us. The first words out of the angel's mouth, out of the angel's mouth was, don't be afraid. Go find the disciples and Peter. He's thinking about others. Jesus, through the, through the angel, says, I'm concerned about you. 
I love you. I want to see how you're doing. I want to reconcile you to myself. And so he speaks through the angel and he says again, I love you. Why are we surprised? This is the same Savior who hung on the cross as people were torturing him who could have come down from that cross and he prays, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He loves us. And he is faithful even when we're faithless. He's faithful to his word. Turn back two pages to Mark chapter 14 in your Bibles. I want you to see this. Verse 27 and 28. Here is what Jesus clearly said to his followers. And Jesus said to them, you will all fall away for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Huh. What did the angel say to, our, to the women at the tomb? Don't be afraid. Go tell the disciples and Peter that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee. He directly kept what he promised he would do. He keeps his word. He makes a promise and he fulfills it. Verse 7 of chapter 16 says, he's going there just as he told you. Your Savior is faithful and he keeps his word. Peter gave his word too. He didn't keep it. Here's what else is beautiful. He doesn't give up on us. I'm telling you what, had those guys done what they did to me, I do not think the first thing on my mind would be, how do I go find them? But he never abandons us. No matter how much you've sinned or how badly you've sinned or how much of a train wreck your life is, you have a Savior that's looking for you. He's pursuing you. He doesn't give up on us. He doesn't emotionally fire us when we don't live up to his standards. He's looking for us because he loves us. He knew they would fail him, Mark 14, 27. He gets us tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. He doesn't ever give up on us. You'll never out sin his love for you. It's the beauty of the gospel. You know what else he doesn't do? He doesn't hold a grudge. He's not harsh with those who fall. He's tender, he's gentle, he's lowly. He pursues the weak and is extra tender to the weak. He doesn't hold a grudge. He doesn't give you the cold shoulder. He doesn't make you pay. He's not passive aggressive to you. You know, uh, being a father of teenage drivers, my kids can verify this, uh, I hope. They'll tell you if I'm telling the truth. My kids have had wrecks with their cars. And uh, I've had time as I've been notified of the wreck to, to say, okay, Jesus, I want to handle this and show grace like you have shown grace to me. And so with each of my kids when they've wrecked, sometimes with tears telling me the, the wreck, I have, by God's grace, I think, said all the right things. I love you. Don't worry about it. We'll get it fixed. I'm just glad you're okay. Grace. At the same time, when I'm driving home to have the conversation, see the kid, to see the damage on the car, I mean, I at least want them to pay a little bit. I at least need to give them a little lecture, just enough to know how serious a car is and, and how they're going to bankrupt the family. And I just, I need them to know, do, do you know, kids, how awkward it'll be for your dad to be in a robe on a moped? You know, like I need you to, to feel, feel that. I'd at least like to teach them a little lesson. Make them pay just a little bit. I want them to feel what they've done. My wife has sinned maybe twice in her whole life, but the, the two times that she might have th theoretically, hypothetically sinned against me and I forgive her, I, I at least need to know, like I need her to feel it a little bit because I don't want her to do that to me again. 
that's just not Christian. Christians don't hold grudges because Christ didn't hold grudges with us. A judgmental spirit, a make-you-pay spirit, a give-you-the-cold shoulder, a be-passive-aggressive spirit to those who've wronged you doesn't look anything like Jesus. All right, the last thing that we see here about our Savior is that He pursues us in order to restore us. He pursues us in order to restore us. First, He pursues them through the angel. Go tell the disciples. Through the women. He's looking for them. And He's never going to stop pursuing us. And he wants them to know, though you've sinned against me so egregiously, I want to go and find you because I want to restore you. You know, I have a, a friend who was in seminary right before us. And when we were in seminary in 2004, we worked at the Sunshine Ministries in downtown St. Louis. Now, if you know anything about East St. Louis and downtown St. Louis, it's a very blighted area, high crime, high murder, high drug use, homelessness. This is back in 2004. And Aaron and I moved into a home down there in which was like a, 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 not a halfway house, but a rehabilitation house for men who had come off the street. We would live in one half and men who had gone through the 10-month program lived in the other half. My friend Greg worked uh, with these men in that program Aaron and I worked with what would have been like Hope for Augusta or Oaks Ministries with, with the high school and middle school students. One day, one of the guys in the program who had been in the program nine months and was about to graduate, which meant he would have come into the house that we were living in, in the ninth month out of ten, didn't show up. My friend Greg couldn't take it. So he went looking through the streets of St. Louis, went to seedy joints and bars and, and places where people hung out, places he thought he might find his friend, and he looked and he looked and he looked. Never found him. Came back to the clinic. And the administration, the directors of the clinic, let my friend Greg have it for placing himself in such danger, for, uh, you know, putting the clinic in danger by him going and looking for his friend in this way. And my friend Greg said, I understand that, but I had to go look for him. I could not sleep if I didn't at least go and try. Isn't that the heart of your Savior? He's, he's burning inside, and the first thing that's on his mind when he is risen is to send the women through the angel, to go find the disciples to say, I'm looking for you. I want to pursue you to restore you. Now, let me just take you in, a, in an hour, maybe three more minutes, if you can wait for Easter supper that long. And I want you to turn to John chapter 21. It's worth it, I promise. John chapter 21. Let me set you the story here for what Jesus does with Peter. This, Peter after Jesus dies, has no faith, no understanding. He's a coward. He's hiding. And he finally, one day he goes, I got to go fishing. because That's what he knows to do. So he goes fishing. And the disciples say, well, we got nothing to do either. So we'll go fishing with you. They get in the boat. They're fishing all night. Jesus is on the, store, the, the shore. They don't recognize him. He calls out, have you caught any fish? They say, we've been fishing all night. None. Huh. He says, cast over to the other side of the boat. Boy, that sounds really familiar. Because Jesus has already done that with the disciples. Immediately, John goes, it's Jesus. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Peter. What an idiot. He's, he's basically half naked, the text says. He throws on something as to not be nearly naked and jumps in the water and swims to Jesus. And when he gets there, the text says the, the, the 153 fish are in the nets that they just caught. 
And Jesus is already frying fish at the beach. He doesn't even need their fish. And he sees Peter. I'm just telling the story at this point. I'll keep going. You don't have to read it. Go home today and look. It's there. Peter and Jesus go for a walk. Jesus says to him, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, you know I love you. Peter, do you love me? He says it a second time. Lord, you know that I love you. Peter, do you love me? A third time. Here's what's amazing. Two parts to this. Peter denies him three times. Jesus says, Peter, I want to take you back there. Not because I want to grovel in it, because I want to meet you in your place of shame with my mercy. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my lambs. Do you love me? Tend to feed my sheep. Three times because Peter denied him. How many? Three times. And then here's what's astonishing. That word that is in John 16 for the fire of coals, that Greek word only appears twice in the entire New Testament, fire of coals, both times in John's gospel. The first time, when Peter is denying Jesus to a servant girl, he's warming himself beside a coal fire. The second time, Jesus makes a coal fire to bring Peter back there so that Peter can experience that and in experiencing that experience, Jesus say to him, I love you. It's astonishing grace. God's goodness is running after us and he will never stop by his Holy Spirit. Hallelujah, what a savior. All right, I, I probably lied and told you it was three minutes. Here's the last 26 minutes. All right, here's the last thing. What are we supposed to do with stunning grace? How do we respond to stunning grace? I would say to you, let's do two things. What Jesus says, love him back. What's on Jesus' mind is restoring Peter so that Peter can experience that love relationship again. What Jesus wants you to do with, the stun, with, a, with astounding, stunning grace is to love him back. He asks you today, do you love me for what I've done for you? And then secondly, marvel at the empty tomb and share it with others. Do you know all through Mark's gospel, at least three times, we see Jesus do something astounding to show that he's God, and he says immediately after that, don't tell anybody. Now, don't tell anybody is go tell everybody. Hey, women at the tomb, go tell the disciples. Peter, go feed my sheep. Go tend my lambs. Go tell of the grace you have received. Those who have experienced the astounding, stunning grace of Jesus and seen the resurrected Christ cannot help but go and share that good news with others. It's stunning grace. Let's respond in that way. Let's pray together. Father, we want to, on this Resurrection Sunday, as you've proven that you've given yourself for us, we now want to give ourselves back to you. We love you. We love you because you first loved us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our last hymn that we will sing together is in your bulletin, The Power of the Cross. Let's stand and sing together.
May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead, our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, before whom all worlds began, both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.